I knew this was a pirate themed conference, but I don't have any I didn't have any pirate outfits at home, so I brought the closest I have, which is like a Gilligan type <laughs> thing here. I got a pipe. I I don't actually know how to use a pipe. I just this is a froth. I was hoping to get one of those pipes. I wanted to get one of those pipes that like blows bubbles and stuff, but they look too much like toys, so I bought a real one. I need to figure out how to retrofit this one. <laughs> anyway, uh, so I saw, um, I saw that Twilio was one of the sponsors. I have a friend who works at Twilio, and we were out the other day, and he just seemed like super hungover, and he wasn't really engaging with me very well. I thought he was just phoning it in. <laughs> Yes! <laughs> 40 minutes of this. <laughs> Sorry, I just thought of that one. I couldn't help it. <laughs> anyway, so I'm here to talk to you about cat care and maintenance. And I want you to know that what we're going to discuss, these are just best practices, okay? They're just best practices. Um, so first off, I'm going to talk a little bit about feeding cats. It's very important. You need to feed them, otherwise they might die or run away or something. You need to do this at least once a month, at least. <laughs> very minimum once a month. Otherwise, they get really upset and they look like this. He, they just get really upset. Um, and then, actually, this is my, my other cat here. She got really upset. They, I don't know why they do this. They sit in the same bowl together. I'm not sure why. The other important thing you need to do to keep cats alive is make sure that you give them plenty of hugs, uh, which I do very frequently. This is one of my hug, hugs that we do. Like, we do this much more frequently than Fridays. This is an everyday thing. Uh, much more frequently than feeding them, for sure. Also, you need to take care of their cat boxes, so I'm just gonna show you a little bit how you do that. Like, this is this is a cat box. You need to make sure to clean that out. But I have to, so I have to tell you something. This is not actually a cat box. This is actually a cake. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm totally serious. I'm very serious. There's actually a thing around this, like Google, Google cat box cakes. You'll find, like, people do this all the time. It's hilarious. <laughs> So I want you to know that all of that might be wrong. I'm not sure. Um, these are just best practices. Again, your mileage may vary with these. Um, so anyway, with that, let's, let's continue to not talk about cat care. This is a Ruby conference. Let's talk about something else. So hello. 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 I, was so, I have to admit, I was hoping that no one would come this morning because <laughs> I'm scared. I thought maybe we could just go out and have a coffee and then pretend that this all happened. <laughs> like, <laughs> I guess not. Anyway, my name, my name is Aaron Patterson. Um, I have come from the United States to bring you freedom. <laughs> 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 yeah, freedom. <laughs> yeah, America. Yes. <laughs> uh, so I work at a company called Red Hat. Uh, and I'm on a team at Red Hat, I'm on the Manage IQ team. We develop a product for managing virtual machines, so any type of virtual machine that you might have. Uh, if you need to manage many virtual machines, uh, you should use our product. It is open source. You can go there and get it. Um, I'm on the Ruby core team and the Rails core team. This does not mean I know what I'm talking about. It just means I'm terrible at saying no. Uh, <laughs> You can find me on Twitter as Tenderlove, GitHub as Tenderlove, Instagram as Tenderlove, and you can also find me on Yo as Tenderlove. So if you want to Yo me, you can just you can use that name. I'm sure my phone is going to start buzzing soon here. Um, I am the number one contributor to Rails. Uh, you can see that I have many, many internet points. <laughs> many points. Yeah, I'm actually, I'm thinking about trading these points in for a flight somewhere, you know, go on vacation or something. Anyway, uh, I want to give you all the secret to becoming the number one committer. There's actually a secret to doing this. I'm, you know, I don't actually know anything special except for this one secret. This one secret. Other Rails committers hate me. <laughs> There's this one secret that I don't want you to share with anybody else, but the secret is that revert commits count too. <laughs> so the more mistakes you make, 
<laughs> the more points you get. <laughs> so, you know, you all can be number one as well. Just make a lot of mistakes. That's, that's how I do it. Um, so I have, as you saw earlier, I have two cats. This one is, his name is Gorbachev Puff Puff Thunderhorse. Um, we just call him Gorby. And then my other cat, her name is uh, SeaTac Airport YouTube Facebook. <laughs> We just call her Choo Choo. Uh, her natural habitat is on top of my laptop. <laughs> this is actually where she grows. We set her there, water her a little bit. <laughs> I told you we would talk about cat care and maintenance, right? Uh, you probably can't see it, but she's just totally mashing the keyboard there. <laughs> anyway, I'm so glad I use Git. Wow. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, recently I've really been, like, I've been studying Node.js a lot recently. And the reason I've been doing this is because I want to get a lot closer to the metal, right? Like, I'm trying to get real close to the metal, and I know Node.js is a way to do it. But, uh, like, recently I've actually done it. I'm very close to the metal now. I, I will show you. I'm, ex I'm extremely close there. Look how close that is. It's amazing. Very amazing. Anyway, so Node.js, yeah, good stuff. So close to the metal. Oh, we're in Belgium. Did you, did any of you realize this? This is amazing. We're in Belgium. And what's one thing that I really like about Belgium is that there's a lot of great beers here. Um, one of the best beers is actually imported from the United States. It's called, it's called Bud Licht. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. It's, uh, <laughs> Bud Licht. <laughs> should give it a try. It's very good. Uh, but I mean, I also tried, you know, not, I didn't just drink this last night. I also had like traditional Belgian beers like Stella. Uh, it's a very, very, very good beer. And I mean, like, don't worry about it. Like, I'm, I'm getting all the Belgian culture. Like, I had Belgian fries last night, went to this traditional fry place. It was super good. So really, really good. Uh, and last night, I was telling some people... <laughs> I got to tell this story. <laughs> uh, so recently, recently my parents found out my name. <laughs> so I want to tell, I want to tell this story. Uh, like I tell my parents what I do, right? I tell them, you know, I, well, I'm a programmer and many like, people know who I am apparently. And I like to program a lot and I guess I'm okay at it, but I never tell them my name. They don't know. They don't know that people know me by tender love. So there was a conference in my, in my hometown, uh, and I decided to myself, you know, I was like, I, I would really like my parents to see what I do someday, like, it should be great, like, at least see me give a talk once. Uh, and the organizer said, hey, we had a person cancel, would you like to come speak at our conference? And I said, yeah, sure, but only if you give me two extra seats, like, I want two extra tickets for my parents, because I'd like them to come see. And the organizer was like, yeah, sure, absolutely. So... You know, we go to the conference, arrive there in the morning, I meet the organizers, you know, my parents are there too, we meet the organizers, and like, he's like, oh, great, you're all here, and he's smiling and stuff, I'm like, yeah, that's great, and he's like, uh, we've reserved three seats for you down at the front row, like, here, I'll take you down there. So we go down to the front row, and there's three seats there, and they have a sign on each of the seats, and the first sign says, tender love, the second sign says, tender mom, and the third sign says, tender dad. <laughs> And I'm just like, no, <laughs> no, not now, not now. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, okay, um, something you need to know about me before I give a talk here is that people on the internet know me by this name, Tender Love, just don't worry about it, just be cool, people are going to ask you, like, just don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> so they're like, okay, okay. I could tell they had more questions for me, but fortunately my talk was like right then, so I'm like, I gotta go. <laughs> so yeah, uh, we haven't talked about it since then. <laughs> I don't know exactly what they think about it. So yeah, it was kind of weird. I was forced to, forced to give that up. Anyway, so let, let us continue on. I've shared this, this topic. Um, I want to talk a little bit about improvements to Ruby. Like, I was thinking about improvements to Ruby lately. I think it's very interesting. So I want to go through some of the improvements that we've had to Ruby over the past 10 years. So if we think about Ruby, like, what was Ruby 10 years ago? If we think about what Ruby was 10 years ago, 10 years ago, Ruby was an AST interpreter. It was an interpreted language that would just interpret an AST. And what this means is that if you had some code that looked like this, it would get 
parsed and turned into a tree and stored internally as a tree, and the tree would look like this, right? And the way that this code would get interpreted is that the interpreter would walk this tree and evaluate each thing. So it'd go to the if statement and it'd say, oh, well, we have some conditionals. We better test double equals. Well, how do we test that? First, we need to evaluate foo. Then we need to evaluate bar. Then we need to check whether or not they're equal. And if they're equal, then we're going to go walk over to the true branch. And if they're false, then we're going to go walk over to the false branch and execute each of those, uh, execute that way. So that's how our entire program worked. Um, and it didn't allow for certain optimizations. Like we couldn't do, we couldn't do some of the optimizations that we can do today on a virtual machine, like people optimization, other various VM optimizations. So. This is the way it was 10 years ago. 10 years ago, we had a, a stop the world and mark and sweep garbage collector where the entire world would just stop. Like it's just GC time. It's like, okay, hold on a sec. Everybody, one, hold on program, one sec. It would go through, mark all the objects, sweep all the objects, and then say, okay, I'm done now. Go ahead and continue. So you'd see these weird jitters in your program. You still see them today, but not nearly as bad as 10 years ago. Today, today, if you look at Ruby of today, today we have a virtual machine. We actually have a virtual machine built into MRI. This came out in Ruby 1.9, so it's, it's actually pretty old. But I mean, 10 years ago, we, we didn't have this at all. Uh, in 1.9.3, we started doing lazy sweeping in the garbage collector, which basically incrementally sweeps objects away. So it decreases GC time by reducing the average time we spend in GC. Uh, in 2.0, Ruby 2.0, we had bitmap marking, and what this is is we keep a table that maps uh, objects to whether or not they've been marked. It used to be before when, during the mark phase of the garbage collector, we would go through and mark each particular object, and what happened was each object would be modified in memory, and the reason this was bad is because uh, it wasn't copy on write friendly. So if we forked off a process, like we were talking about yesterday, forking off processes, um, if we forked off processes, as soon as that object got marked, it would have to be copied into child processes. So what bitmap marking did is just said, okay, well, we're gonna keep a smaller table that has all of our mark bits on it. So only that smaller table needs to get copied among child processes. So this helped out with, uh, this helped out a lot with uh, memory use utilization in the garbage collector. The next thing we had now in Ruby 2.1, we have a generational garbage collector. This is actually pretty amazing. Uh, it separates, the generational garbage collector is a restricted generational garbage collector. It separates objects allocated in C versus objects allocated in Ruby and also has a write barrier for those objects so that we can actually have multiple generations for objects allocated in Ruby. So then thinking about, thinking about tomorrow, like just coming up around, coming up soon here, this year we're gonna have Ruby 2.2, which is gonna introduce symbol garbage collection. We're actually gonna have symbols be garbage collected. And this is, if you watch any of the security releases for Rails, you'll know that this is actually a huge deal. This is a big deal because a lot of our uh, security vulnerabilities are due to denial of service attacks where symbols are not garbage collected, so we may allocate a symbol inside of Rails, that'll never get garbage collected, and if people keep allocating symbols over and over again, it'll use up all the memory and crash the process. So 2.2, we're gonna have symbol garbage collection. There are some caveats to this, and we can talk about it in the hallway later or during Q&A, but yeah, we're gonna have symbol garbage collection. This is huge. We're actually gonna have incremental garbage collection in Ruby 2.2. So previously we talked about uh, incremental sweep phase, the lazy sweep. Uh, in 2.2, we're gonna have an incremental mark phase as well. So even further improvements to the garbage collector. And actually a few weeks ago, I was at uh, Ruby Kaigi and I saw some presentations there. One of the presentations I saw was actually a JIT for MRI. Like a true JIT. This thing would just in time compile Ruby code down to machine language. So it turned, you could get uh, the demonstrations that the person gave, showed, gave us like between two and 10 times faster, uh, two to 10 times faster code for uh, using machine language or machine instructions. Uh, so you can go check out the project there. Uh, it had some bugs, but I mean, it's amazing to see this stuff, which is why I put question, question. We have no idea when this will come in. But the point is, these are unimaginable improvements. These are amazing. 10 years ago, we would not have imagined this. 10 years ago, we would have said, oh, garbage collection, like generational garbage collector? No way, impossible, impossible. But even today, you'll look, if you look at the uh, benchmarks game, you'll see we're actually starting to beat Python in benchmarks, which I think is interesting. Because for the longest time, Python people have trolled us about how fast Python is versus Ruby. But it's actually, we're actually starting to catch up, which I think is really, really awesome. 
So this graph shows Ruby time divided by Python time, which means that the lower the bar is, the better we are in that benchmark. But what really annoys me is that people still complain. People still complain. They're like, oh, Ruby is slow, or Ruby, you know, this or that, the garbage collector sucks, all this stuff. But if you see, look at these slides, you'll see, like, it's not true. Ruby is getting really, really good. There's just a lot of this FUD that's out there. So what I wanted to do is I've, I've decided to invent a new language, a new programming language. And I'm calling this language Poolang. This is the language. Uh, this language is specifically engineered to be the worst language ever. So even worse than PHP. <laughs> uh, so like, the point of this language is that, so if anybody ever says to you, like, if you think Ruby is bad, have you seen Poolang? Come on. I mean, that is the worst thing ever. Like, side benefits, are, side benefits about this language include many, many jokes. For example, in Poolang, everything is a code smell. <laughs> we're not class-based, we're file-based. <laughs> uh, I've decided that I'm going to implement this entire language in Excel. <laughs> For speed, I guess. And to see if I can do it. It'll be amazing. This will be the best language for working with Excel ever. Because <laughs> we do that all the time. <laughs> anyway, so Poolang will be the worst language ever. Uh, and you can go check out our website, poolang.org. Um, the website has some known issues. As soon as I posted this website, like this is what it looks like in Safari. This is what it looks like in Chrome. Uh, <laughs> So I get this bug, like I put this up there, it, this is literally the entire site, right? Uh, I put this up there and immediately somebody files a ticket. It doesn't work on Windows. <laughs> you see this box. Somebody else files a ticket, oh, it doesn't work on Chrome. But I need you to know, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care. The language is called Poolang. I mean, see, come on, seriously. <laughs> anyway, so yes, go ahead and check it out. Uh, we'll be releasing some Excel code shortly. <laughs> anyway, today, let's move on to some serious topics. Very serious topics, especially for 9.30 AM. This will be amazing. Uh, we're going to talk about some GC garbage collection tools. We're going to talk about memory profiling. We're going to talk about speeding up helpers in Rails. And we're also going to talk about speeding up, uh, speeding up like output, output from Rails as well. This is just some of the things that I've been working on in Rails recently. And what I want to share with you today are the tools that I've been using for doing profiling against Rails. So hopefully, you can use these tools with your application as well. Uh, and I'm going to focus mostly on uh, memory profiling and that type of performance. So first thing I want to talk about is some GC tools. Now, most of these GC tools come built in with Ruby, and I'll point out when it's a gem versus when it comes built in. Uh, the first one I want to talk about is object space dump and object space dump all. These ship with Ruby. I believe it's in the standard library. And the way that you use it is you use object space dump with one particular object. You give, it, you give it a Ruby object, and it gives you information about that object. So you use it like this. Here I'm finding a model from Active Record, and I'm dumping that. And the dump output is JSON, and this is the JSON output from it. And you'll see like you get the address of the object, the memory address of the object. Oh, by the way, these APIs are extremely specific to MRI. Most of the stuff I'm presenting today is very specific. So don't expect this to work on other virtual ma or other machines. Uh, so it tells you the type, tells you the class, instance variables. It also gives you references and stuff. Uh, and you'll see down there that WB, WB protected. That's actually the flag for whether or not this object has a uh, uh, write barrier protection. Uh, so the next, the next one is object space dump all. And what this does is it dumps your entire heap to a JSON file. So if you call this, if you execute this code, you'll see the return value is just this file, like file handle, and that's a JSON file that's full of your entire heap. It's your whole heap dumped out as JSON. What's cool about this is I can say like, okay, I'm going to take that previous object, the object ID or the memory address that I had from that um, from that active record object, and I want to actually visualize the memory about that object. So I can see like what, what that object is and all of its references. So if I take those two pieces of information, I can parse the JSON file and reconstruct all the references, turn it into a graphviz.file, and you get something that looks like this. So you can see at the very top there is the active record object. Those are all the references that it holds. Uh, going down the object tree or, or object graph. One thing that I think would be cool, and this doesn't exist today, is it'd be really cool if we actually had a dump server built into the Ruby process itself so we could actually connect to that 
connect to the process and say like, hey, dump all this stuff out to give me, a, dump your heap out as a JSON file and give it back to me. Uh, we could probably do this pretty easily today in Ruby, except that doing it in Ruby would impact our heap dump. Uh, so <laughs> that might defeat the purpose. Anyway, the next, the next tool I really like to use is a tool called GC stat. This is also built in. Uh, you can call GC stat two ways. You can call it with no arguments, and it'll return a hash, or you can call it with an argument, and the argument is a key for that hash. So the hash is just a bunch of statistics about, your, about the garbage collector, and I haven't, I haven't listed all of them, but there's like a bunch of different keys. Uh, now, I prefer to use the second call, which is gc.stat with a, with a parameter. The reason I choose to do that, or the reason I typically do that, is because calling gc.stat actually allocates a new hash, which means that monitoring your garbage collector also impacts the garbage collector, and we don't want any cats to die or anything like that, so it's better to use that bottom one. Uh, so you like here are all the keys for it. Uh, I know it's very small, but I need you to read them all and memorize them because there's going to be a quiz at the end. Uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> so the one, the main one that I like to use is total allocated objects, and what this one does is it returns to you the number of objects that have been allocated in your system ever, ever. So starting every time an object is allocated, this incrementer gets bumped up one. So you know like how many objects have been allocated throughout your entire system ever. And you can see how this works. Like here's an example of it. We'll say we'll allocate, we'll ask, say, say like give me the number of objects allocated, then we'll allocate 10 objects, then we'll ask again. And you'll see the return value here. Those two numbers on the left and right are exactly 10 different from each other because we allocated 10 objects. So we can use this to figure out like, well, how much does it cost to call find on active record? So we'll say, like, all right, give me the total number of allocated objects, uh, find 10 records, and then uh, count the total number of objects, and then divide by the number of records that we found, and then we know how many objects it took, how many objects we had to allocate in order to find one active record object or find one model. Uh, so what I did is I took, this, I took this particular test and I ran this across a bunch of different branches and these are the branches I ran it across. Down along the x-axis is the branch that I used or the branch I tested against and the y-axis is the number of objects allocated per uh, active record model. So you can see like 3.0 stable, we went up, up and then now at 3.2 three, stable is the worst. Uh, and we're going down with 4.0, 4.1, and finally we get down there to master, and master is very good compared to all of these. Uh, I don't have the 2.3 numbers up here, but 2.3 was actually down around master. And the thing, like, I kind of think this is sad because, like, 3.2, that's a lot. <laughs> that's huge. The thing, to take, the thing to take away from this graph is please, please upgrade. <laughs> Please upgrade. Uh, but we, you know we shouldn't have gotten we shouldn't have gotten up to three two stable levels. And I think this is this is interesting because we don't actually have a way a good way in Rails right now to make sure that we don't regress with things like this. We don't have a like we have a very large test suite, so we make sure that there aren't any bugs introduced. But as far as like performance, uh, you know, runtime performance or memory allocate, memory usage, we don't have any ways to measure that over time very well right now. So this is, we're just starting to do stuff like this, and this is like first examples of it. And now that we're actually looking at it, we can say, oh, wow, how did it get so big? Let's fix it. Um, so I, wanna, I also want to show, like, this is a demonstration of testing a request. Like, I wanted to study how many, like, how many objects do we allocate for just making a request through the system. And what this does is it constructs a rack environment and it pushes a request through the system and then measures the number of objects allocated for that. So what this is testing is just the books new. This is just a normal scaffold, like scaffold page for books new. The first thing we do is set up the request. Uh, this like sets up the caches, basically heats up our application. Uh, and then we actually run the test down here and figure out like, well, how many times, you know, how many objects have we allocated through the system? And this is a, this is a graph of it. There's a graph of the results. You'll see along the x-axis, those are our branches. So master is looking extremely good. Like we're down there, very, very low. But you need to know that the very bottom number is 2,000. <laughs> Um, so this is not just a talk about performance or cat care. This is a talk about how to lie with graphs. <laughs> so if we make that very bottom number zero, it looks like this, <laughs> which is very sad. It makes me very sad. So this, this graph doesn't look very good, but you need to know this is actually a 19% reduction in object allocation since 4.0 stable. Like this actually, this sounds very good. 
14% reduction since 4.1 stable, and we're going to get even better. Like, I have ideas for improving this even more, so I think we're going to see even, like, an even greater reduction of object allocations in the future. Uh, oh, thank you. I will use this chance for a water break. Some fine vintage water here. <laughs> 2014. <laughs> So the next thing I want to talk about is this gem allocation tracer. And this gem was written by Koichi Sasada. He's been working on all of these awesome GC features that I showed you earlier. Uh, allocation tracer gives us a really amazing view into the garbage collector and, and the memory consumption that we have in our processes. Uh, so definitely check out this gem. I'm going to walk through some of the features of the gem, not all of the features, because it actually has a ton of stuff in there. Uh, so one thing I like to use with this is I want to look at total object allocations for an active record object. So this, this is how you use allocation tracer. You just have trace. You give it a block. Inside the block, you uh, run, your, run your test code. And this will tell me the total number of object allocations, but it does it by file and line, right? So if I run this and sort it down at the bottom there, I'm sorting it by the most the highest number of object allocations, you'll come out with a result that looks like this. These are just the top, I don't know, top four, I suppose, uh, top four locations for object allocations when running that particular test code. Uh, and the top here, the very, well, I guess it's the very bottom here, the, the worst offender is hash accept. And what hash accept is, is you say, like, it is an active support thingy that's like hash.accept, you give it some keys, and then it's like, I'll give you a new hash, that doesn't have those keys in it, right? And this is what the code looks like. So this is what it looked like inside of Active Record. We'd say like, okay, types.accept, give it a bunch of keys, and then iterate over this hash and do some stuff with it. And you'll notice that uh, this actually create, this allocates a new hash. Uh, like I said, uh, it allocates an array because it accesses the keys. Uh, calling with star args allocates another array. Uh, so you can see where object allocations are starting to build up from this. And essentially, if you look at this code, essentially what we wanted to do here is we wanted to iterate over one hash, but just skip keys in the other one, right? We just wanted to skip those keys. That was, that was like the point of this code. So I refactored it to just say, okay, let's use each key and go to the next one if, um, if, it, if that key is contained in the other hash. Right, so what this did is we changed keys. We, I didn't use keys.each, you'll notice I used each key. And the reason I did this is because calling.keys will actually allocate an array. So we'll allocate an array and then iterate where you can call each key on the hash and it won't allocate an array, it'll just yield each key in the, each key in the hash. So you can avoid, uh, avoid an array allocation there. Uh, so then here I said, well, we're just going to do next if key. And the reason we do this is because this avoids allocating a, allocating a whole new hash that we're just going to throw away. It also avoids allocating an array, which is what that splat args does. So we can say, well, just skip if we have that key. Right? Now, if we apply this patch in both places where we're using hash.accept, I'm not showing the other example of hash.accept. It's slightly different. Uh, mostly the same, but slightly different. If we apply that patch, we'll actually see that the allocations goes down even further. So that's right there. We have master, which is what I showed you earlier, and then master plus one, which is this commit. What's also interesting is that we can get allocations by type. So that previous uh, output that I showed you was total allocations per line, and that doesn't really tell us like what was being allocated. We know us together in this room this morning, we know by looking at that code that we are allocating hashes and allocating arrays, but maybe you don't know that. Like, you look at the code and maybe you don't know that. You know that because I told you, or you know that because you have experience with that code, but maybe you're not sure. So you can use Allocation Tracer to find what types are being allocated, and you do it like this. You say, give me the allocated count table, and that will output all of the objects, the total allocated objects by type. So you get a hash back that looks like this. This isn't the entire hash. This is just a sample of it. Uh, but you can see, like, you know, we have 68 strings allocated, 63 arrays allocated, et cetera, et cetera. So we know what types were allocated. And here's a graph of it over time as well. So these are uh, along the x-axis there is the type, and then uh, y-axis is the count, and the different colors represent the branches. 
And you can see like T data, object hash nodes, the, those don't change very much. It's really the array and string that we want to look at. These are, these are our big movers and shakers there. And you can see like master, we reduce strings greatly. Uh, also arrays, we reduce a lot. And if we break this down by just uh, master plus that one commit, if we just want to compare those two, compare master plus the uh, accept patch that we are applying, uh, this is the change that we see. We see, okay, well, we reduced hashes, and we also reduced array allocations. We didn't touch strings. But we all knew that looking at the code. We, we knew that before, but maybe you didn't know that previously. And you can use this tool to find out what exactly you, or what impact you're having on your code base. Uh, so the lessons from this are, one, avoid active support. <laughs> now, unless, unless performance doesn't matter, this, this isn't necessarily true. I shouldn't, I shouldn't bash on this completely. What I'm saying is, like, if you have some bit of code that you know is a hot spot, you probably don't want to be using active support in that particular case. Active support is probably doing extra work that you could just be doing with regular Ruby code. Uh, so, you know, measure your code, look for those hot spots, and avoid, probably avoid active support in those particular cases. Uh, also, allocation tracer is amazing. Like, really get this gem, check it out, like, try it out on your code. It has way more stuff, but I did not cover all of it. Uh, so the next thing I want to talk about is speeding up helpers. So I'm going to use these tools that we were talking about to speed up helpers and Rails. Uh, and if we take a look at profiling a request and response, like we saw that benchmark previously, if you look at the output from that request response benchmark, you'll see output that looks like this. This is our, the percentage of time, like where we're spending time. And you'll see that the very top line there where we're spending the most time is in active support, safe buffer, initialize. This object is used for HTML sanitization in Rails. So if we rerun this benchmark and find where those objects are being allocated, like we use allocation tracer, figure out where these things are being allocated, inside of Rails, you'll see that they come from this particular method called tag options. And what this, what this method is for is for outputting the options in your tags. So like, for example, in your form tag, you'll have you know, the action, the action uh, attribute, or in your a tag, you'll have the href attribute, all those. That's what this method is for, is outputting those. And it all comes from this ERB utils h. So it comes from this. This is the thing that actually does, the, does uh, escaping on your code, escaping on the value. So to understand what this method does, let's talk about HTML standardization in Rails. In Rails, ordinary strings are considered to be dangerous. So we say, if you say, like, give me a string, we say x is equal to a string, we check it, it's a string class. You ask if it's HTML safe. It says, no, it's not. And what this means is that when we output that string, we're going to escape it. Right? So when we go to write that data out to the client, we're going to escape it. Now, let's say you have a string that you consider to be safe. You can call .html safe on it, and that'll return to you an active support safe buffer. And if you ask HTML safe on that, it'll return true. Now, the important thing to note about this is that this is just tagging the string. Right? This is just tagging it as HTML safe. You could actually have some dangerous data in here. But what it means, when you tag it as HTML safe, that means that Rails will not touch it. We keep our hands off of it, and we write it out to the client as is. So you need to make sure that it's escaped before you tag it as HTML safe like this. So the ERB utils H method, what that does, that does both of these things. So the important thing is that ERB utils H, it actually does the escaping and the tagging. So we have two separate processes here, escaping and tagging, right? Now, if we look at this method, we'll see, well, it actually generates a string using gsub. So gsub, this does the escaping, escapes it into a new string. And then we actually call HTML safe on that, which, which allocates another object. Uh, the safe buffer in Rails is actually a subclass of strings. So we're allocating two objects here, two strings. So we allocate two objects. Now, if we go back and look at the caller, We'll see, OK, we call ERB's util h on value. We assign that over to value. And then we immediately interpolate value into another string. Like, it's, it's immediately interpolated into another string. And this is a real string. So now this, this return value is considered to be not HTML safe, even though that value was HTML safe, right? OK? So what, if we're thinking about this, this, this is a total of three object allocations. So we had ERB utils h allocate two. Now we're allocating one more with this uh, string at the bottom. So we've allocated a string. At first, that was our escaping. We allocated a safe buffer, which was when we called .html safe. And then we allocated another string 
when we returned at the very bottom. So if you think about this, we're actually taking that safe buffer and throwing it away. It's getting interpolated into that string and just thrown away. And what is the point of the safe buffer if it's put back into a regular Ruby string? There's no point. So my idea was we'll just remove the safe buffer. We don't need it. We don't need to do that test. So to fix this, I extracted a new method called unwrapped HTML escape. And all this thing does is just the, the G sub. That's all it does. It returns an escaped string. But it does not tag it. It doesn't tag it as safe. It just returns the escaped version. Then I refactored the original method to call un unwrapped and then call .html safe on it. So now it's completely backwards compatible, right? So then I updated the callers to say, OK, now call unwrapped HTML escape. And then it assigns that to the value. That value gets interpolated into the string. So now we're, we only have two object allocations, just that string, the, the first escape string, and then that second interpolated one. Now, we only eliminated one object. But what was interesting is that this actually decreased the allocations, 200 allocations per request for that particular thing. For, for that one particular scaffold. And if you think about this, like, I, that seems like a lot of objects to, be, to reduce, but your mileage, yes, we're, I realize that we are not in the freedom country here. <laughs> we measure by freedom units, mileage. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, your mileage may vary on this because it's really dependent on how many tags you're outputting in your, in your HTML, right? If you're outputting a whole bunch of tags, then this optimization is going to be a huge win for you. Uh, so the next thing I want to talk about is speeding up output uh, using the law of Demeter. Now, I think it's interesting that people call it the law of Demeter because, like, you can't get arrested for violating it, right? Like. <laughs> Nobody's going to come out to you and be like, oh, you violated the law of meter. You're going to jail. <laughs> well, except in the US. That happens there. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so the law of the meter basically says, like, we're going to, I'm not sure exactly what the whole definition is, but the way I interpret it is, like, we're only going to handle certain types. We only want to handle, like, it's not about the number of dots in your method. It's about the number of types that your method handles. So we're going to talk about how to use that in order to speed up, speed up output from Rails. So let's take a look at an ERB template. This is, a, this is an ERB template. Uh, we compile that ERB template down to some Ruby code and then evaluate it and cache that. Uh, this is what the compiled template looks like. Please read it carefully. Again, test at the end. Uh, <laughs> Please memorize. I'm no, just kidding. So if we zoom in on part of this, we'll see like this is what this is what a very small chunk of that ERB template looks like. Uh, we call safe append there with a string. This is this is an HTML literal. This is the literal that was in your ERB template. We call safe append with that. Uh, now if we go look at the implementation of output buffer, safe append equals. If we go look at that implementation, this is what it looks like. This is the method, right? What's interesting, what's very interesting is that the ERB compiler guarantees that this method will never be called with a nil. It's always called with a string. Always. So why are we doing a nil check? Why, like, I looked at this, I'm like, the ERB template guarantees we have a string. Why are we calling with nils? Who cares about nils? We don't, we don't need to handle nils. So I just said, all right, we're not going to handle nils anymore. <laughs> Goodbye. If you called this method with a nil, don't do that. Call with a string. So I removed that, removed that line, and we ended up with this. So then it's like, OK, we're calling super with value.2s. But we know that the ERB, again, earlier I said, the ERB compiler guarantees we're being called with a string. So what's the point of calling 2s on this? We know it's a string. We know it's a string. So we'll remove that, remove that part. Uh, now, now value, like we're just calling the super class with just value, right? We're just passing in value. And we know that if we just call super without any parameters, it'll do that automatically for us. So we just remove that, right? Um, but now we know we're just, we're just calling straight super. We're just calling super. We're not doing anything in this method, which means that we can just completely remove the method. So now it just goes away. And this is our extremely high tech code. <laughs> it's very, very high tech. Um, so I'm not sure if this is, this is a law of the meter or not. Like, we're handling this particular nil. Before, the, before, that method used to handle two types. It handled nil types and string types. And maybe something else. We don't know anything that responded to us. But we know that that method really only needs to handle strings. It really only needs to handle strings. Our ERB compiler guaranteed that we would only be getting strings. 
So I'm not sure if this is a law, that was a law of Demeter violation or not. Um, I think maybe it was, it was probably defensive programming. I think somebody was actually writing that method and said, well, what if somebody passes us a nil? What if somebody passes us this or that? But it's very powerful for us to say, like, we know what this is going to get. We know it will be this. We know it will be this, and we'll only code to that. We'll only deal with, like, if anybody starts passing in a nil, at that point, we're going to probably say, hey, don't do that. Or if there's an extremely good reason for them to pass a nil, then maybe we'll start handling that. But the first thing we should default to is like, hey, stop it. Make sure you pass us a string, right? It's very powerful for us to say, I only handle strings. So if we go back and take, uh, take object alloc or allocation tracer gem and measure the results, like let's take a look at what the results look like. Uh, this, is, this is a graph of the different types. Uh, each color represents the branch. And you can see like we've actually dropped tons of strings, tons of arrays, and tons of hashes as we go down the side there. Again, this is essentially a rehash of our previous graph that just gave us a total allocation, but now we know like what has actually been reduced per branch. So again, like this may not look impressive, but again, it's 19% reduction since 4.0 stable, 14% reduction since 4.1 stable. Uh, so to conclude this, I think I'm hitting my time. Uh, if you can, the best thing you can do in your system is to eliminate objects. If you can eliminate object allocations, it'll greatly help out your performance. Um, the next thing, I don't know who said this, but no code is faster than no code, really. Like, I didn't even bother measuring the performance of that previous, when we were looking at that output buffer thing, like, I didn't bother measuring the performance of that because, well, it's deleted. We're not even executing that code anymore. What's the point? Obviously, it's faster. First, we were doing something. Now, we are doing nothing, right? <laughs> That's weird to say. Now, we're doing nothing. OK. Anyway, limit types. Limit the types that your method handles. If you can limit the types, you'll end up with less code. The fewer types you have in your method, the less code you'll have. We saw that in the previous example. Less code means faster code. But the important thing is make sure to measure all of this stuff. Measure, measure, measure everything. You can't know if you've improved unless you measure. So after you've done all this stuff, uh, one more time, measure again, please. <laughs> so thank you for having me so much. I appreciate being here. This is, this is an amazing conference. Thank you. Uh, if we have time for questions, please. Otherwise, thank you very much.